I'm Mark. Welcome to Nate Sutan. If you've been following us at home uh, with, uh, the pa with some of the literature we've been going through over the past couple of weeks uh, since we started the fall rotation, uh, I've been in the Gnostic Gospels. Uh, last week, I had just, our last show that I had taped, we had just finished up the Sethian Gnostic Gospels, uh, ending with a letter of Peter to Philip. And now we're going to go into the, uh, the, the Valentinian Gnostic Gospels. There are nine pieces of literature in all in those Gospels. Uh, the, it's uh, got the, starting with something called the Gospel of Truth and uh, the Gospel of Philip uh, through to the round dance of the cross. So nine pieces of the Gnostic literature in all. Uh, I'll be reading the intro to uh, at the beginning of the Valentinian uh, Gnostic Gospels. It gives a, kind of a backstory or ba uh, overview of exactly you know who these Valentinian Gnostics were. So I wanted to, for as much as I've spoken about the, the, the Gnostics, whether the Sethian or the Valentinian, there's a few things that I think that I would be remiss if I didn't go over actually uh, in this episode to better clarify exactly what made a Gnostic and what their worldview was and, and how they saw the character of Jesus and stuff. I mean, I've explained a lot of different things with how they felt about the Genesis narrative all the way up through Jesus' ministry and stuff. But today I want to go into more detail, specifically specifically with, with inter, you know, the Gnostics saw Jesus' ministry a certain way. And I think that it would be a really good idea, instead of just saying that the Gnostics saw Jesus' ministry a certain way and interpreted it a certain way, uh, to give examples of why they saw what he was saying a certain way. And why something like perhaps, for instance, the, uh, the the Gospel of John was so poignant and meant so much to the Gnostic, and some of it is very uh, it's a, some of it's a very radical de uh, departure from what the uh, mainstream Orthodox Christianity had developed and cultivated over these past two thousand years. So I wanted to start with a with a little saying. I got a little uh, bit of a blurb here um, in in the intro from the intro of the Valentinian uh, Gnostics uh, introduction. And it is, by means of unity, each one of us will understand himself. By means of knowledge, one will purify himself from multiplicity into unity, devouring matter within himself like fire and darkness by light, death by life. I'm sorry. Uh, devouring matter within himself like fire and darkness by light, death by life. So this is a, what kind of the, the worldview was for, say, at least the Valentinians and the Sethians were very close too, with what they thought that the pathway to God was, or the being able to cleave to God, uh, the Father, as it were, again was. So um, I was perusing the New Testament for examples, um, and, and it's rich for examples of of how it seems that the Gnostics viewed what Jesus was saying and how they thought that it had a Gnostic bent on it in comparison to, say, for instance, uh, how it was interpreted by, again, by mainstream Christianity. And uh, I'd like to go over some of them. I have written down at least, uh, I have down, written at least 10 examples of parables and examples from Jesus' ministry that when they were said, the Gnostics interpreted them in a particular way. Thus bolstering the belief that he was actually, it was to, to them, it was the truest meaning to what he was talking about. Uh, giving the first example of uh, Jesus uh, the, using the parable of the seeds thrown into the ground. Some seeds got thrown into, uh, uh, on, into rocky soil and uh, they weren't able to take root. Um, and some were thrown into thorny soil, and some, were, and then others were thrown into rich soil, and they were able to grow. To the Gnostic, this idea was that each person, of course, there is agreement with Christianity uh, about the idea that each person is the soil, you know, but the outcome is different. For the Gnostic, this idea of the seed was the seed of gnosis, the seed of wisdom, the seed of understanding, the seed of growth, so that 
once you um, awoken to this seed that was planted inside of you, then you progressively grew in the cultivation of gnosis so that you can um, you could speak speak a truth and you could speak the truth in comparison to the idea of this idea of faith is I mean the seed is no more than uh, the faith that one cultivates is a, is a, a is an orthodox or mainstream Christian. Now, to jump around just a little bit, this idea of the seed in the loomy soil or in the good soil where it grows, when Jesus said the idea of um, you will know a tree by the fruit it bears or when he cursed the fig tree because it didn't have the fig for him to be able to eat when he was hungry, Jesus likens every person to a tree also. And again, it's relatively easy to understand that you will know a tree by the fruit it bears. For the Gnostics, this idea was like the seed that grows in a good soil from the beginning initiation or the awakening with the Gnosis, one grows into this tree that bears fruit. Your life experiences, what you've cultivated in awareness, little bits and pieces of understanding and wisdom and insight about how the world works and how we're supposed to interact with each other. These are part and parcel of what makes a Gnosis, uh, 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 an active, um, moving, not radical, but um, vibrant, dynamic. Dynamic is the word I'm looking for. Uh, a dynamic Gnostic. The more Gnosis that one absorbs, the more that they grow, the more fruit that they have to bear. And Jesus, in saying you will know a tree by the fruit it bears, was more or less pointing out that in any person, you know, if a person is stuck on a per, uh, particular aspect of, of, of their existence, whether it's a bitterness or anger or resentment, or they have compassion and they have love and they have insight, these are their fruits. Every person, myself, you, the viewer at home, any person is pursuing these, these teachings and understanding what we say in our worldview are the fruits that we bear. And the Gnostic in, in their growth bore more and more fruit to be able to share with people an insight that they were able to spread. Uh, there's the parable of the three pieces of gold, which, uh, if uh, again, if the viewer at home is familiar with that parable, uh, it's where Jesus had said that there was a master who gave each one of his servants a piece of gold, and the first servant went out and earned ten pieces for the one piece he was given, and the second servant went out and earned five pieces of gold for the one piece of gold he was given. But the third servant was afraid that he'd lose the gold, so he buried it. Now, it's my personal conjecture that I think that to the Gnostics, the idea of the gold was your life. You know, being born into this world of ex uh, experiential pleasure and pain in existence is like being given a piece of gold. And your experiences that you cultivate and the wisdom that you, that you cultivate to yourself are kind of like the earned pieces of gold. For the one piece of gold that you have, which is your life, all the experience that you bring back to make yourself stronger, to make yourself more aware, are the returns, the dividends, the 10 pieces of gold. But one who takes their gold and buries it, and they bury it in fear of going out and exploring the unknown, uh, stepping outside of the boundaries of what is familiar to them, being very rigid and dogmatic in their understanding and their beliefs, these are the things that uh, that would be interpreted as burying your gold because you, you don't want to have any kind of variance in what is familiar in your life experience. And for that, the father, as it were, would curse that servant. So the, the parable of the three pieces of gold actually fits very tidily into the Gnostic worldview of exactly what Jesus is talking about. Uh, the loaves and fishes that fed 5,000 people. To the Gnostic, the word, and again, there is some agreement with with uh, with organized Christianity or mainstream Christianity or Orthodox Christianity with Gnostic view that uh, it was an allegory or metaphor for the idea that the word feeds, you know, and one person sp one person speaking a word can feed an audience's spirit of ten, of fifteen, of five thousand. So, to the Gnostics, when a person achieved these Gnostic levels when they absorbed more and more Gnosis and they were able to speak this Gnosis to other people, it fed them, the, the five, the 10, the 15, the 20, the 5,000, the 25,000 of what was listening to this one person speaking this Gnosis. So for them, the loaves and the fish actually fit nicely with the idea of the cultivated Gnosis inside of the individual person. Um, remove the beam from your own eye before uh, removing the mold from another. Uh, from, from the eye of another. 
the Gnostics, again, with this internalization of the process and the deconstruction of the self that, that I think is one of the cornerstones of the Gnostic beliefs, there is a critical self-evaluation. One asks themselves, uh, um, you start deconstructing yourself about what your worldview is, why you feel the way that you do about the law and about what is fair and what is good and what is just. And you become preoccupied with deconstructing the self so that you start questioning whether or not your responses to the world that you find yourself thrust in are appropriate or godly or, or, or moving towards wisdom. So such that you're so preoccupied, as it were, with deconstructing the self that you don't have time to um, try and remove the small little mole from another person's eye. Uh, also, and it is that realization, too, that there is so much undone in me that I can't uh, that I can't be a hypocrite and point out what somebody else is doing when there's so much undone in me that I have to fix first. Now, there have been opponents to this idea that, uh, for instance, it's been pointed out by some uh, Christian uh, groups that, and because this this in some ways has uh, some very strong uh, Buddhist underpinnings to it, underpinnings to it. The, the idea of, of, of going into the self and exploring the self, on its surface, one might say it seems a little selfish because you, you become somewhat almost narcissistic in, in just doing the exploration of self. But the idea is, it could be, I think it could be, be effectively kind of argued, that the idea is you have to fix yourself first before you can effectively try to help anyone else. And the only way that you're going to be able to fix yourself is by concentrating on yourself, by focusing on what is it undone in you. You know, so that you might learn how to cultivate empathy, because, again, it can be argued from a philosophical standpoint that there are different pathways that people will work to try and gain something like perhaps um, empathy. You know, the idea of being able to put yourself in someone else's shoes or feel the pain of someone else. And that can be expressed in like charity work and putting yourself in situations where you're working in a soup kitchen or you're working with the poor and the downtrodden, and you're working with the sick, those rejected by society. And it is noble and it is good and it is praiseworthy that one would, would put themselves out there to try and help others as long as the underlying motivation is true, as it were, um, we do it because of what we're trying to learn about ourselves. We do it because of what we're trying to discover about ourselves and how we compare it to those that might be suffering. Not because we consider our good deeds as part of a, a meritous process where we have gained merit and favor in the eyes of, of the Father or Jesus or whatever so that we might um, get to heaven on that merit system because that in and of itself smacks of a, of a level of selfishness. So I think that it can be effectively argued that this process, when done well of self-exploration and deconstruction of the self, the end dividends of it are it makes one more empathic. It makes one more aware of those around them. It makes one more aware of their place in the overall totality of the environment and in the world that they that they find themselves thrust into. And um, it makes them a better person. But for the Gnostics, it starts with exploration of self. And the idea of removing the beam from your own eye is the first factor that has to be reckoned with first before you can even think about helping someone else. Jesus cast out demons in the cemetery. Uh, you know, the, 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 the part of the, uh, in his ministry where uh, the people that were, had been wandering around um, the cemetery and strong men couldn't hold them down and they would break the chains of people that tried to tie them up. And Jesus had cast out the demons that were inside of these people. Well, the demons, um, I should actually preempt this with, um, in the beginning part of the, of the, of the Valentinian in the, in the intro, it talks about the idea of, of there's like a, humans are in a haze, and in that haze there is fear and terror, and that fear and terror must be dispelled so you could, and that haze must be lifted so that one could see God and move towards God and seek gnosis. This idea of demons, now when we look at it from a very, uh, a, a very basic level, 
it's easy to assume it's it's autonomous external factors that got into these people. When one believes in this idea of devils and demons that come in from an underworld that inhabit a person and make them gnash their teeth and be crazy and howl in the in a cemetery. But for the Gnostics, this idea was people that were so broken by their experiences, they were so um, rent by the pain that they had suffered and they were so immersed in this fog of fa fear and terror and confusion that the touch of the word of God clarified things for them. It blew away the mist, it blew away all the fear and the terror and they sat quietly in their own minds. So uh, it said, uh, I think at the end of that, at the end of that story in the, in, in, the, in the Bible, in the New Testament, it talks where they were uh, found sanely and quietly sitting on the ground after Jesus had cast the demons out of them. But for the Gnostics, the demons were no more than all the aspects of what is undone inside the individual person to cause this fog of ter terror and fear to descend upon them. Um, Jesus healed the blind and the lame, which again, for the Gnostics, is the idea about healing the blind, you know, so that one could see well, so that one could see clearly. Uh, healing the lame so that one could walk towards a particular goal. When the hand was withered or the, the foot was clubbed and one couldn't walk well, the metaphoric ramification was the gnosis, the healing of of, of the teacher, of the Messiah, of, of the quiet teacher that guides, was one that cleared the vision so that one could see well, so that one could acquire the gnosis required to be able to go back to heaven, so that one could fitly and effectively walk towards the goals of achieving the Gnosis. So for the Gnostics, even the idea of healing the blind and the lame fit into th this overall over overarching idea that it was Gnosis at its key that moved the person towards, uh, cleaving towards God. And um, Jesus himself said, um, he, used, uh, he used terminology of light and darkness and metaphor all the time. Um, and the, the Gnostics saw that idea of the difference between being a sleeper and awake, or unaware and unconscious or aware. <coughs> For them, the, the metaphoric terms light and darkness were no more than, specifically that's what he was talking about. Darkness to the Gnostic was being unaware, unaware unawake, asleep. Light to the Gnostic meant being awake, being filled with, filled with gnosis and growing towards cleaving to God again. And Lastly on the list, before I get to the one that's very radical, which is a very radical departure, uh, Jesus said, if you would follow me, you must pick up your own cross and carry it. So Jesus' life and what he expounded upon and the wisdom that he had, he was saying to the Gnostics, in their view, the best way to follow him was to follow his example. And what was the cross? What did it mean? Uh, there's uh, the idea of uh, almost like a self-mortification. You crucify yourself upon the cross of yourself, which means that, and this has got um, a couple of different ways to explain it, this idea of a ritualized death. Uh, it's, it has a, much to do with identity of who we think we are. And who we think we are shapes how we respond to others, how we feel about ourselves, and what our role is in the world, and our worthiness to say, for instance, go back towards God. So this critical self-evaluation where one cultivates gnosis, um, deconstruction or, or, or crucif uh, crucif crucification of self, annihilation of self in Zen Buddhism, uh, shamanic death in Toltec shamanism, we question those aspects of our identity and what makes us motivates motivates us inside of those aspects of our identity, and through gnosis and through acquiring of gnosis, we have a purge of self, so that these parts that are ineffectual to us, they hold us back, they keep us in this darkness and in this fog and in this terror and fear are exercised away. Uh, I've heard the term celestial surgeon before. A uh, celestial surgeon that cuts away the cancer so that the whole overall organism can live. These negative aspects of ourselves, whether it's too rigid adherence to law, um, uh, being a racist, being a sexist, um, uh, shaking your fist at God, uh, saying that these aspects of life aren't fair. These aspects of self and things that we haven't come to terms with, in the Gnostic view, are healed and purged from the self in the seeking of Gnosis. And, but it's going to be different for every person. When Jesus carried his cross, he was carrying his cross for himself, for what was undone in him, 
or by example, he wanted to show what wasn't done in the individual person. So as I would have to carry my own cross, you, the viewer at home, would have to carry your own cross, as any person would have to carry their own cross. And through the internalization process and the gnosis, you heal what is undone. And that's different for every person. My issues are different from your issues as they are from any other person's issues you might pass on the street. Everyone is in a different place in their development. And again, that's one of the key concepts with narcissism too, that they seem to, in some ways, infer that we're all in different places in our development. The, the, the playing field is in, isn't vertical, but it's actually horizontal. Um, and we're all in different places in our movement back towards the light or back towards God or back towards the All-Father, whatever you want to call it, the overall, overall conscious spirit, the creator of the universe. The Gnostics believe that the playing field being level, every person is in a different place because every person's got a different thing to heal. And we can heal that best through gnosis and the knowledge that, that we acquire, we, we acquire into ourselves to heal and clear the fog and the fear and the, and the terror. Now the last part that I want to talk about, about how the Gnostics interpreted Jesus and what he was saying, and as I said, I gave uh, like perhaps around 10 examples. There are more examples in his ministry of things that he said and that he did where the Gnostics uh, thought that he was talking all about Gnosis and the core of his ministry was about Gnosis. Um, and I could probably come up with more examples given more time, but I want to try and condense and dovetail it down a little bit so that we can move forward into some of the uh, Valentinian Gospels before the, end of the, uh, before the end of this episode. But the last big point that I want to bring up is um, within the Gospel of John. Now, the Gnostics saw the Gospel of John, which is the last Gospel the, the, uh, in the New Testament, of Mark, which is first, Matthew and Luke, and then John, who is said to be the most beloved apostle of Jesus. But for the Gnostics, they believed that the Gospel of John was, was a um, Gnostic tractate, 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 a story. It was a, it was a, it was a Gnostic story based upon what John had written about what Jesus had said. Now, again, this is the radical departure, and I know that it's going to sound very uh, controversial, but bear in mind, this is what the Gnostics thought Jesus was saying when he said what he said. And I have to go back to, I have to go to in the Gospel of John to some of the most important statements Jesus made. Now, uh, to, to remind of you at home, only in the Gospel of John does Jesus claim to be God. In Mark, Matthew, Luke, he does not. Only in the Gospel of John. I mean, how many of you know the viewers at home have seen John three sixteen at football games or baseball games and stuff like that? Is because those Christians are holding up the sign about accepting Jesus as Savior and Jesus as God and stuff like that. Um, this is very significant because the Gnostics were looking the, at the exact same things and getting the, a very different understanding about what Jesus meant. And this is the case in point, and as I said, I know it's very controversial, but it's very interesting to contemplate because you're looking at the same thing and getting two different meanings. Jesus' statement, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the truth, the light, and the way. No one comes to the Father but through me. In many ways, this is the linchpin for the Orthodox Christian fundamentalist groups of today. Uh, if there is a God that created the universe, his son was saying specifically, without exception, the only way that you can get to this God or this father is through me. So it rules out any other belief system. It rules out Buddhism, Taoism, Islam, uh, uh, Judaism, Buddha, um, Hinduism, any other religion, because Jesus is specifically saying, I am the truth, the light, and the way. No one can come to the Father but through me. That is their, is their crowning achievement for, because every, every religion likes to lay claim to having the, the exacting, correct dogma. And for um, fundamental Christianity, this is their exacting dogma, the, the exacting, correct dogma in this statement. The point I'm bringing it up is because the Gnostics heard this and got a completely different understanding of what he meant when he said it. And it could be used as a point of reference to the Gnostic goal. Because the Gnostics, and, and it was uh, in the secret book of John, and I believe it was in uh, the book of Baruch, and it's also in the Valentinian literature, 
when Jesus is talking in these in these gospels, he uses the idea of this body that I wear. He says it in a couple of different places in the Gnostic Gospels. Now that's significant because Jesus is differentiating himself from the body. He's saying, I'm not that body. He just says, I am the bo- th- this body that I wear. It's significant because of identification, because fundamental Christianity identifies this singular man as the way to be able to get to God, where the Gnostics interpreted the spirit that was in the man pointing towards getting to God. The reason, and the key to this for the Gnostics was through Gnosis, one acquires that spirit, that same spirit that spoke through Jesus and says, I am the truth, the light, and the way, the Alpha and the Omega, I am, can be acquired through gnosis and a steady growth, a raising of awareness, the scattering of the fog and the fear and the terror and coming to the clear light of day of the understanding of God and the cultivation of gnosis, you become, I become, any person becomes as a Gnostic, the Alpha and the Omega. We become the truth, the light, and the way. We become, no one can come through the Father but through me. So for the Gnostics, the, the reason why John was so poignant and so relevant and it was considered to them a Gnostic story was because Jesus was pointing the way for them to become like him. Because Jesus did say um, the idea of um, seeing himself in all, uh, others and others in him and um, doesn't your old, your old Testament, your, your Bible say you are God's and, and Jesus said, if you understand what I'm teaching, you will have the same, if not more power that I have. So all these things taken together uh, spell out a particular different kind of um, a totally different understanding of what Jesus was getting at. And Again, to reiterate, and as I know as controversial as this is, the Gnostics believe that the individual Gnostic became the truth, the light, and the way. They became the Alpha and the Omega. They became a son of God like Jesus was a son of God, or the spirit that inhabited that man that was Jesus, who was a son of God. And this is very different, and I know it's very... Um, inflammatory, it's easy to understand why the early church called it heretical, because uh, it, it ran, in a lot of ways, very contrary to the idea of the singular Messiah, who was the Son of God with the Spirit inside of him, against a group that said that all become the Son of God, all become these things that he's claiming to be. And um, again, as I had gone through Sethian literature, and I had gone through, I'm going, I'm going to be entering into Valentinian literature, part of the reason why I brought this up too was because much of what is written in the Valentinian literature, you'll hear that kind of underpinning um, alluded to, that idea in much of how they fleshed out their writings. So it's giving more of an overview of like the Gnostic thought, uh, the end result of, of why you cultivate this gnosis and stuff. And it is distinctly different from the, uh, from the, Christian, under, uh, from the Christian interpretation. Now, Let's see. I'm going to be going into the. Um, I'm going to be going into. Before I go into uh, the, the beginning of. Um, before I go into the beginning of the uh, the Valentinian uh, introduction, again to point out, and though I know I don't want to belabor the point, and I was thinking about having a dry erase board up just so that I could write it down so I could differentiate again. Everything that I just put out on the table. Uh, one of the, I think one of the very relevant questions um, that may be asked if a person was to play devil's advocate, if a person was to run contrary to what these Gnostics thought, you could go back to the idea of, again, the basic premise of the idea of sin. Now, um, I, I've known of some, uh, there's a, uh, uh, there's a, uh, a YouTube uh, character, a YouTube uh, person, uh, he's a, uh, Ray Comfort, he's a fundamental Christian out of New Zealand. They call him the Banana Man uh, because he was saying that the banana was is evidence of God because it fits perfectly into the human hand, and there was debate about that back and forth. But I bring Ray Comfort up because I've seen some of his interviews where he's going around and he's asking people about sin. You know, have you ever lied? Have you ever stolen? Have you ever cheated? Have you ever, you know, uh, committed adultery? All these different things. And, you know, invariably, of course, every person has to admit, yes, I've done these particular things. 
So, uh, so for him, by fiat, he says, well, that's proof. Nobody is without sin. Only Jesus is without sin. So you must accept Jesus Christ as your Savior to be able to achieve heaven or be able to get to heaven. Now, the reason why I bring it up again was because, again, basic premise. The fundamental Christian idea is this inherent sin, uh, which is violation of law, because he mentioned lying, cheating, cheating, stealing, taking the Lord's name in vain, adultery, all these different things, are violations of, of, of law, of, of Mosaic law, the 206, 213 laws of Moses, the Ten Commandments plus uh, 600, not, not, I'm sorry, not 213, 613. The Ten Commandments plus 603 laws of Moses. So from a fundamental Christian perspective, when Ray Comfort says this idea that when you've done these particular things, that's proof positive that all fall short of the glory of God. Only Jesus didn't fall short. And again, that's interpretation of what that word sin means. And I bring it up again because in footnote number four on page 262 within the Valentinian literature, it, uh, it says it is ignorant, the, the Gnostics believe, it's ignorance rather than sin that is the source of of human problems, such as terror and fear. So again, to bring up this idea that for um, its interpretation of, of, of the human condition, for a fundamental Christian, because we do these particular things, we lie, we cheat, we steal, we do these particular things, that's evidence that we're deficient. And so because it's evidence we're deficient, it could be labeled sin. And it's sin and it's proof positive that we're all going to fall short. For the Gnostics, the idea of lying and cheating and stealing is no more than ignorance or if, uh, applying sin in its truest definition, which is missing the mark. When one steals or one lies or one cheats or one is selfish, you're missing the mark of, of uh, authentic existence, uh, to live as an upright person, to be able to move towards God in, inside a Gnostic view. So your sin or missing the mark is your ignorance. And that ignorance causes suffering. And in some ways this has a, a, like a, a Buddhist milieu underneath it too. This idea of like your, where you are in your level of awareness determines your level of suffering. The more ignorant you are, the more you will suffer. For the Gnostic, the more asleep you were, the more unaware you were, the more immersed you were in this <coughs> fog of terror, terror and fear, the more you suffered. And we, so you would continue to sin, you would continue to miss the mark and continue to do these particular things. You continue to lie, you continue to steal, you continue to cheat and hurt and be selfish and all these different things. When one starts to wake up to Gnosis and the, the fog begins to clear, slowly but surely one starts to eschew these errors, these missings of the mark and move towards divinity and move towards cleaving to God. So again, uh, without belaboring the point too much, it's taking this idea of sin and applying it very, very differently. Sin from an Orthodox Christian worldview is evidence that uh, it, it, when, you, when they've evaluated the human condition of why, I mean, when we lie and we cheat and we steal and all the different things and call it sin, it's evidence that we fall short or deficient. For the Gnostics, sin is no more than or the hurtfulness is no more than ignorance that could be cleared by gnosis. For the orthodox Christian or the fundamental Christian, this sin that's an inherent part of our nature can only be cleared by the intercession of the Messiah whose blood, you know, was shed for our sins. So again, the Gnostics and the fundamental Christians or the orthodoxy that was forming around that time looked at his teachings and what they, uh, you know, that piled on top of uh, the... Uh, the following of rabbinical law and um, what was uh, expected for a messianic age or what the different factors, factions in that area thought Jesus' purpose was, whether it was militant and he was going to lead a coup that was going to release the Israelis from uh, Roman rule and they're going to be able to autonomously govern themselves. All these different factors, factions, um, interpreted Jesus' teaching a particular way. Pushing all those aside again, going back to the fundamental Christianity in comparison to the Gnostics, they had different interpretations for what Jesus was teaching, thus different remedies for the problem. What's the end goal? The end goal is to get to heaven. And before I leave it off and I go on to the Valentinians, when I, put, I talk about the idea of the end goal for the Orthodox Christian the, idea, the, the end goal was achieved by accepting the fact that we're inherently flawed because of sin, 
accepting Jesus as our personal Savior and intercessor and his blood washed away our sins, thus achieving heaven. That was the end goal on that side. For the Gnostics, we are in a fog of ignorance and unawareness and we are asleep. And through Gnosis, one wakes up, corrects for the error, turns towards the Father, and, then, uh, and thus achieves heaven gradually over time, thus cleaving to God again. And uh, as I said just before I leave it off, it's interesting for the Gnostics, this idea of one last thing. When one accepts the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, it's kind of like crossing a line. You've crossed the line and you've been saved by His grace. Uh, many of you have seen uh, perhaps the bumper stickers out there once in a while. Christians aren't perfect, just forgiven. And in a lot of ways, it, it speaks to the idea that they've crossed the threshold. Because they've accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior, they've crossed the threshold that has guaranteed that they'll get to heaven. For the Gnostics, the idea was that, and of course, because they incorporated the idea of reincarnation, and the idea that one will, it, it was brought up again in the, um, in, uh, the, I think in the Book of Baruch and uh, the, the Secret Gospel of John, where Jesus was talking to John and he said that, through the error, one is bound in chains and thrust into life again, and the foot or thrust into suffering again. And in a footnote, the author points out that Jesus was talking about reincarnation. Because one doesn't break the chains of the ignorance or the or, or uh, being asleep, you're forced to continue this path or this cycle of ignorance. So, again, distinctively different for the Gnostics, when one starts to grow in Gnostic understanding. Because every person is different, and every person is in a different place, and every person has uh, different aspects undone of themselves, everyone's time is their own. They will all move towards cleaving to God again in their own time of healing. And that could take a lifetime or lifetimes, uh, no matter how long it is. What's important is as long as one continues to seek gnosis and one continues to strive towards becoming the, becoming the, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Um, I am, the, I am uh, the truth, the light, and the way. Uh, it's a gradual process, highly contingent on the individual person's effort. So again, as I want to try and get uh, more of a better clarifying overview of why the Gnostics saw Jesus' teaching a particular way and how they interpreted what he was saying in comparison to the orthodoxy. Uh, I'm going to move forward and start to read a bit of the Valentinian, a little bit of the, oh, is it Peter? Uh, the Valentinian literature. Now, um, the first book in Valentinian literature is the Gospel of Truth. And um, it gives a little bit of an overview of who uh, Valentinos was, Valentinos was, and, uh, you know, his worldview and where his group uh, uh, formed and, and who was members of this Gnostic group and what they thought. So um, just go into it a little bit now and try and read through it. I want to get through the whole thing before... Time runs out on me. The Gospel of Truth, a work of consummate artistry, is an early discourse on Christian Gnostic mysticism and remains a key philosophical and literary document in the history of Valentinian Gnostic speculation. Incorporating much of the technical language of Valentinian Gnosticism, the Gospel of Truth presents its ideas in a non-technical way as a proclamation of the meaning of Jesus, of the meaning of Jesus for Valentinian Christians. This is a pivotal work, reinterpreting Jewish apocalyptic Christianity as Jewish Gnostic Christianity. A deeply Gnostic tra tractate, Seminally influenced by Johannine literature, again, you know, they were very influenced by the book of John uh, and, and the literature that came out of uh, the secret book of John and, and, and the book of John that's recognized in the New Testament. The Gospel of Truth maps a way of knowing the Father through the word of Gnosis, which is mystical knowledge. Written in Greek in the mid-2nd century, so we're talking 140 to 180 AD, 140 well, Jesus died in 33 A.D., so 140 to 180 A.D. The Gospel of Truth 
was found among the documents of the Nag Hammadi in Egypt and exists in its totality in Coptic translations. In addition, Irenaeus refers to the gospel of truth read among Valentinians in his tra uh, tract against heresies. And again, Irenaeus was one of the heresiologists who, uh, because he was part of the, the burgeoning orthodoxy that was, that was forming the church, would write papers and treaties against uh, particular things he called heretical, um, and uh, well, the uh, gospel of truth was one of them. Scholars have advanced arguments for assigning the work to Valentinos himself rather than one of his students. Valentinos, a med uh, mediator between Gnosticized and traditional Christianity, was born in Alexandria and from about 135 practiced his Gnostic interpretation of Christianity in Rome. Although Valent uh, Valentinians were attacked by traditional Christians for their mystic theology as early as 160, they did not initially separate on their own from Christians, and some held uh, ecclesiastical ranks in the Roman Church. They called themselves the students of Christ, were largely from the middle and lower classes, and resembled other Christians in many respects. The Valentinians met privately and later in churches as students guided by scholars. Many of their leaders were women, which is interesting because uh, the early church didn't have women as leaders, but this Gnostic group actually actually did um, accept this idea that, you know, and again, this is a controversial, uh, there have been some scholars that put out the idea of Mary Magdalene's importance in the, in the gospel teachings and what Jesus might have conferred to her and taught her in comparison to what he taught to the to the apostles. And, uh, you know, of course, historically it's played out where um, the teachings and the, and the people who were in the church were male-dominated. But the early Gnostics actually had women at high-ranking high levels to teach. Many of the leaders were women from which Gnostic Christianity held out positions as leaders and teachers not available in an official church. The Valentinians saw their mystical theologies as allegorical commentaries on the Hebrew Bible and Christian scripture, but their opponents saw them as extravagant heresies. In Valentinian Gnosticism, Christ and the Word, or Logos, are external beings, or aeons, and Jesus is brought forth to bring salvation and enlightenment here below. This recalls the Logos made flesh in the Gospel of John, but beyond some common interpretation of the life of Christ, their belief in documents clashed. One cannot read the Valentinian documents without concluding that Gnosticism was different, not just allegorically, from mainstream Christianity. The Valentinians offered a whole new scheme of salvation through knowledge and an, and an, and an, and an unknowable father in the heavenly realm of light, which is the pleroma or fullness. Traditional Christians were right to suspect otherness in the Valentinians. So this last paragraph that I just read actually is like a brief summary of much of what I talked about in the first half of the show. Uh, the, the Gnostics believe that uh, um, salvation through knowledge and an unknowable father in the heavenly realm of light can be obtained through the, for the individual person. Again, which is different from the idea of Jesus as, as a savior for the, uh, for the fallen and broken uh, sinful. The gospel of truth begins with Jewish Christian enunciation of joy in the good news of the gospel, which brings hope to those who seek the Father. The following lines describe the generations of ignorance and error, which derives ultimately from the Father. Here, ignorance, terror, and error reside in the Pleroma, which resides in the Father. It is clear that this represents a crisis in the Pleroma, sight of the 30 eons of light. But the text suggests that the Father is neither responsible for the error nor diminished in his power. In the contrast, the paradox between the error and the pleroma and the goodness of the Father, we have perhaps the most fascinating aspect of the Sermon of Truth. Somehow, from the very realm of the good Father, error comes. Herein lies the mystery for Gnostics of the goodness of the divine and the reality of evil in the world. This section ends with the appearance, of with the appearance and death of Jesus the Anointed, whose fate at the hands of error, and it's and it got a parenthesized, whose hands at the fate of error is described in an amazing passage that, in a few words, set Jewish Christian orthodoxy apart from Gnosticism. Now, again, this is, I know it's controversial, but it's very, very interesting. Um, the Gnostic interpretation of Jesus being nailed to the tree. And 
again, tracing it back to this, you know, some of it traces directly back to the idea of eating from the tree of knowledge in the Garden of, of Eden, the tree of knowledge of good and evil in the Garden of Eden. But this little paragraph here, he was nailed to a tree, Jesus crucified. He became the fruit of the knowledge of the Father. He did not, however, destroy them because they ate of it. He rather caused those who ate of it to be joyful because of this discovery. So Jesus dying on the cross was a bearing of fruit. Uh, the lessons that can be learned from it, uh, laying out the final piece of the pathway that one must follow to be able to gain gnosis to get to the Father. That was the fruit. He became the fruit of knowledge in, in that sacrifice. So that every Gnostic who pursues it can acquire this knowledge themselves. And he did not, however, destroy them because they ate of it. Like, just like God had kicked Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden from eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. This passage reverses the fundamental biblical notion that knowledge is sin. And again, this is very important for the Gnostics. This passage, rever this passage reverses the fundamental biblical notion that knowledge is sin. It is it dissolves the original structure, stricture against obtaining knowledge by eating of its fruit, for which disobedience came a punishment of shame, sensuality, and death. Rather, here in the Gospel of Truth, the fruit of knowledge is a discovery bringing joy. It signifies that one finds God in oneself, that the fog of error and terror is gone, and that the nightmare of darkness is exchanged for an external heavenly day, which one uh, experiences right in the present moment, not after, after death where they go to a heaven. Therein is stated the essence of gnosis. The word of knowledge redeems rather than kills. And uh, I just as a little footnote here, um, just to point out, and this isn't necessarily casting aspersions at mainstream Christianity for this particular tool, but or what was used. It's just pointing out what in a lot of ways is, is pretty self-evident when one evaluates the system. The acceptance of the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, your personal Savior in the Orthodox belief system. For one, it's an idea that doesn't actually give the person a choice because the idea is you have to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior or you will run the risk of going to a place where you will suffer for all eternity. And it is, again, I think pretty self-evident that that's not really a choice. Um, when you say you have to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior because of sin or go to hell, who's going to say, oh, I'm going to go to hell? You know, every person will say, well, I have to accept. I, 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 I've got no choice but to. This, in a lot of ways, is an interpretation based on uh, manipulation of fear. The, the orthodoxy has used, through history, fear in a lot of ways to compel people to toe the line, as it were, or to accept the doctrine as, as the truth. <coughs> and, um, again, it's not casting aspersions at the... Um, at, uh, at uh, the tenets of the belief system, the Christian belief system is just pointing out that this is one of the tools. And that there are those that argue that that's not necessarily true, but I think that if we're going to be thoroughly honest with ourselves in our presentation of uh, the, the root teaching of Jesus um, and the sum and total of what our lives are supposed to be at the very end, if we're going to go to a place of reward or punishment, Fear was used, you know, um, whether it was through the Inquisition or, uh, you know, or the idea of the different people that were told to convert or die, um, all the way up to now where it seemed relatively benign. You can still find little, um, there's that little, uh, I forgot the name of the press, the little booklets that you'll find sometimes in um, truck stops or in phone booths. Or in different places that that uh, they're cartoon books, the little booklets uh, out of uh, some some uh, Baptist churches out of Tennessee or the Carolinas, and I, I, I'm guessing the, the the some of the audience may be familiar with them. Chick Publications, I think it is. Uh, as I said, they're just little booklets that are cartoons, and they're they're Christian in nature, and it tells a story about the unredeemed person, and then he goes through some kind of suffering, whatever, and all of a sudden he has epiphany, and he accepts Jesus Christ as his Savior, and then at the end of it it says, what will you do? 
You know, what will you choose? What will you decide? And in some ways, it is, again, a manipulation of fear, even though it's relatively benign. No one's twisting your arm behind your back to accept it. You could just as easily take this book and throw it in the garbage. So there's not necessarily anything threatening about it. But the point is, it's relatively benign now to where, as it was used as a, a tool through history, it, it was it was a pretty uh, dramatically and severely and savagely used. I bring it up because Gnosticism doesn't use fear to entice a person to move towards God. They use the idea of, of burgeoning and growing Gnosis. And actually, the Gnosis is what dispels the fear for the Gnostics. If there's this unconscious state that we're all in, because of the fallen state, we've all fallen asleep, when we gain the Gnosis, all the fear dispels. Like uh, the vapor in the morning, that's when it's exposed to the sunlight. Uh, and that's very significant, a very significant difference in many ways between the Gnostic thinking and some of the mainstream Christian thinking. Um... So as, as I read here, this passage reverses the fundamental biblical notion that knowledge is sin. Dissolves the original stricture against obtaining knowledge by eating of its fruit, for which disobedience came a punishment of shame, sensuality, and death. Rather, here in the gospel of truth, the fruit of knowledge is a discovery of bringing joy. It signifies that one finds God in oneself and the fog of error and terror is gone. I know I've already read this part. And that the nature, the, the nightmare of darkness is exchanged for an external heavenly day. Therein is stated the essence of gnosis. The word of knowledge redeems rather than kills. There follows an idealized moving portrait of the sun of whom the father is not jealous and who utters no threat of dashing teeth or hell and brimstone to fellow Jews who do not accept that he is the Messiah. And again, it's a Gnostic idea that they're not using fear and the threat of uh, being cast into hell or the uh, gnashing of teeth or anything or brimstone uh, to, to uh, if, if Jesus is the Messiah. You accept it and you gain knowledge and you gain gnosis and move back towards God through your own effort or you don't and you stay in darkness. That's kind of like as cut and dry as I can make that. In addition to be being a quiet guide of sheep gone astray, which this Valentinian literature calls Jesus the quiet guide. That's one actually section. The implied Jesus also teaches a portrait of the Father's face. We soon realize that the Father, not the Son, is the center of the sermon and is personified and endowed with utter sweetness. The return of the awakened ones, the return of the awakened ones, the individual Gnostics, is then described in a superb, superb poetry of Gnosticism. Until the moment when they who are passing through all these things awaken, they see nothing because the dreams were nothing. It is thus that they, can, they who cast ignorance from them, like sleep, do not consider it to be anything, nor regard its properties to be something real. But they renounce them like a dream in the night, and they consider the knowledge of the Father to be the dawn. It is thus that each is acted, as if asleep, during the time of ignorance. And thus a person becomes... A person comes to understanding as if awakening. And happy is the one who comes to himself and awakens. Indeed, blessings on one who has opened the eyes of the blind. God's face is sweet and his will is good. God gives his aroma to the light, which his spirit smells. God's presence is deeply joyous and sensual. He brought the warm fullness of love so that the cold may not return, but the unity of the perfect thought may prevail. The agent, of human re the agent of human return is the Son. The Father exists in the saved, and they exist in the Father. So we exist in God, and God exists in us. Such is the place of the blessing. They are in that truth and eternal life, and speak of the perfect light filled with the, with the seed of the Father, in which is in his heart and in his fullness. The gospel of truth is an exhortation of truth, a sermon of hope. We hear again and again a cheerful intellectual message of knowledge that dissolves the darkness. And this is that last part. What then is that which he wants such a one to think? I am like the shadow and the phantoms of night. When morning comes, this one knows that the fear that has been experienced was nothing. So that was actually the intro to the, uh, the, the gospel of truth and uh, just getting into the Valentinian uh, Gnostic Gospels. 
I hope that some of the uh, things that I've gone over today uh, clear, more clearly define how the Gnostics had actually thought, interpret, interpreting what Jesus' ministry and the core of what his ministry was all about. Um, I've just about run out of time, um, and I'd like to thank you again for joining me. Um, hopefully my co-host JC will be back with us at some given point. And if you have any questions, comments, criticisms, you can always go to our Facebook page, uh, Nate Sutan. Uh, we welcome any kind of comments or criticisms or, or anything, any kind of input, any kind of feedback. Point us in a direction. My name is Mark Power. I'd like to thank you for joining me again for another episode of Nate Sutan. Good night. <laughs>